So for this, we have Kent and Jordan, a little bit of background. Both Kent and Jordan work at our Rapid City office, and uh, they were systems administrators, and now they're kind of moving up the ranks. They're doing some testing stuff. And they were like, we would like to put together a nice little webcast, kind of getting things started with web app, or not web app, wireless-based attacks. Try to do as much live hands-on demos as we possibly can. Now, as soon as they brought that up to me, they said, we want to do lots of live demos. I was like, don't. And uh, they said, no. We can totally do this. And I said, no, it's perilous. And they're like, we want to face the peril. And I said, OK. Um, but we also have screenshots. So everything that they're going to do, if it breaks and goes down in flames horribly, we have screenshots with step-by-step -step instructions that they're going to go through as well. So you guys will get all of that. This session is being recorded. The slides are going to be made available to absolutely everyone. So it's going to be a good session. I'm just going to, uh, please, just a little bit of peril, just a little bit. Wow, um, I'm going plenty. to be hanging out. Uh, we got plenty of apparel. Sierra is here, and and a Hi, lot everybody. of you last uh, the last one, you guys were like, are, are Sierra and you in like a tent, like uh, like a, like a tent made out of sheets? <laughs> yes, yes, we it were. Was our blanket uh, fort. It was our blanket fort. Um, no spankings, no spankings, spankings. Um, uh, uh, people yes, and I'm recording. Uh, John, even though oh, like okay. I'm answering your questions, it's really me. It's yeah, it's John, John, yeah, Sierra's. I, we can't tell. <laughs> Um, so yep. if, it, if it looks like John's answering your question and talking to you, it's, it's me. Sorry. Sorry to disappoint. All these years so I, question thing. And I, I think that so, since we started down this path, I think that what we're going to do is just continue with as many references to Monty Python, uh, Search for the Holy Grail, mm -hmm. since we have that set up. So speaking of facing the peril, and it's too perilous, and maybe just a little bit of peril, um, I'm going to hand it over to Jordan and Kent, who are not here. I don't know why I'm motioning for the doors. Um, but I'm going to hand it over to them, and they're going to kick this thing off. Uh, Kent, and Kent and Jordan, you guys have the con. Take it away. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks, John. Appreciate the intro. Well, of course, what we got coming up is Wild West Hack and Fest, and I think Sierra's got some words on that. Oh, yes. So I don't know if you guys have buy your tickets to Wild West Hack and Fest, but it is going to be awesome. And we're super excited about it. Uh, our newest development is that we're getting um, the speakers kind of scheduled and working on, like, really putting it on paper. So it's very exciting. But we are going to be at, like John said, besides Minneapolis and also besides Denver. And we bought the best thing to take to those conferences, a life-size cardboard cutout of this horse and rider with the face cut out so you can be John Strand. So, if I wasn't so I lazy, one of those places. letting you know yeah. you'd, be, you'd be terminated immediately. Um, but uh, OK. <laughs> uh, it's not you, though, because the face is cut out. It's just the horse and rider. All right. Why well, you gotta hate? You can have awesome. burn base in the horse. I, I get yes. it. Okay. okay. See? Yeah, I know. I knew I would be fired if I actually made it a giant John Strand on a horse. But so far, so good. So there you go. I hope you buy your tickets, and I hope you guys can come hang out with us. It's going to be so awesome. All right, Kent, up to you. Awesome. Let's let's get started here. Uh, first thing we want to really say is that uh, we are definitely bringing up. Uh, all of this last minute. It has uh, been a lot of work going into everything, and we're ready to, to get started for you. So let's go. Um, the webcast we're doing today is uh, attacking and cracking Wi-Fi. And really, what we want to bring up is that we don't want anyone leaving thinking that wireless is incredibly secure or also can't be secure. Uh, obviously, Wi-Fi wi is a, a security vector that it can cause a lot of problems and it can definitely be an entrance into an environment. So some of the things we want to talk about today, uh, we definitely want to try to get this live demo in. Again, Jordan's working on it right next to me here trying to get that working for us. We're going to talk about some uh, Weigel and targeting of the uh, network for some recon. Uh, we're going to talk about some man-in-the-middle attacks, uh, doing an uh, evil access point configuration with Radius, and then uh, moving on to some 8021X client stuff. So we're going to jump right in here. Uh, with Black Hills InfoSec, uh, I actually just got employed a few weeks ago. It's awesome, but I've been doing some contract work with uh, for John for the last uh, six or seven months now. My background, uh, I came from uh, different IT roles starting back in the day with uh, working at ISP doing Internet Help Desk. It was a lot of fun. Uh, moving on through business analysts doing big data analyst, uh, analysis. And then later on, coming having a, being in charge of a help desk and Got me MCSC and all that fun stuff, and really I do a lot of stuff with compliance and regulatory. Um, that's kind of where my fun stuff is. But 
Uh, I really love what I do here at Black Hills InfoSec. Yeah, that master's degree in business and MCSC has helped uh, us understand our uh, lab infrastructure, attacking Windows systems, uh, Active Directory in general. Uh, that level of knowledge has been uh, very helpful in spinning up our lab environment and getting things uh, running. So we're happy to have you, Kent. It's been nice. Thank you. Um, I come from a background of uh, networking primarily. Got hired out of college working at Hewlett Packard. Uh, worked in their network engineering team for five or six years and uh, developed a sound knowledge of um, physical layer, layer two, layer three, layer four, troubleshooting. Entire stack. Entire stack. <laughs> Now, this is actually a picture of you guys, right? Like walking down the hall with a whole bunch of gear in your backpack, freaking out all the rest of the tenants in our building, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> I would only... say that it's accurate, mostly. We didn't freak anybody out, but yes, that, that is Yeah, exactly. Perfect. People rarely say anything, even if you look very uh, threatening. Yeah, absolutely. And Jordan's got some stuff coming up for B-Sides that kind of goes over that, too, that Definitely, if uh, you see something, say something. Moving on, uh, in our labs here in South Dakota, we've got a lot of things going on. Um, we try to do a C2 a day that's been going a little bit difficult. You start to run into some C2s that are kind of crazy with malware. So we're, we're going to work yeah, and John basically gave and us a malware list and said, yeah, run these. Whatever. Yeah. Whatever. And capture it. it. And just so you guys know the attendees, what we're going to do with these C2s is after we have a good collection of these command and control captures every single day, we're going to release them as another webcast that we're going to do where everyone can walk through like the bro caps, looking at uh, network packet captures and all those things. But we'll talk more about that later. Let's jump on and uh, let's get on, to, get on to the wireless stuff here. Absolutely. Moving on forward, why we're doing this, again, we wanted to so, show uh, the flaws in a typical deployment. We're going to show a better way of doing things, and of course, we're going to show the current abbreviated kill chain phases. Yeah, that's something that came up here internally lately, and uh, it's, it's just made a lot of sense for how we operate. <laughs> we're going to discuss the current working threat intel. Uh, we're going to talk about encryption and, and hashing and why those two are so entwined. And then dehashing, and there's an interesting discussion about Hashcat and masking and some other fun stuff. And of course, uh, we really want to tell you how to do Wi-Fi configurations better. So moving on forward, uh, this slide, I really want to say it doesn't mean a whole lot. We kind of put it in here as a joke. Um, you'll notice the abbrevi abbreviated uh, cyber kill chain there in the center of the uh, three circles. I call it the Milky, Mickey Mouse cyber kill chain. You know, it, it really comes down to knowing where your threat is and how it all comes together and, and acknowledge that wireless is definitely a threat vector. I also want to kind of discuss here. So basically we're going to recon somebody and then in between recon and going on site is where we tried to integrate threat intel. And Ken, if I'm correct, we didn't integrate threat intel because I don't know what threat intel is. Exactly, yeah. And you know we can try to get that from recon, but yeah, and this this kind of goes into a larger conversation of threat intelligence, cyber kill chains, and they basically dropped this in to, to, to infuriate me. So good job guys. Well done. So. Absolutely. We'll move on forward. We're going to jump right in here. Uh, but let's let's discuss these phases real quick. Go back here real quick. Yeah, absolutely. So basically, in the in the wireless reconnaissance, wireless pen test methodology, we're going to try to discuss kind of what we do here. We do recon our customers, and we use a site called Wiggle, which you're going to see next, or Weigel. Um, we review the SSIDs in proximity to our customer locations. We go on site. We gather data. We capture packets. We use all the various tools, whether it's Kismet, Airmon, Aircrack. Um, we crack those four-way handshakes. We also attempt to gather net NTLM credentials if you've got a radius infrastructure. Uh, depending on the scope of the penetration test, we're going to run vulnerability scans against your wireless gear, and we're going to do our best to you know, review what's going on in there and rinse and repeat. Uh, obviously, you want things to get better over time, so if you do have an engagement that's uh, multiple iterations, you want those iterations to get progressively better. So moving forward, uh, recon, finding an SSID. Uh, this is Weigel.net. Uh, essentially, it will go out and find SSIDs that have been uh, GPS tagged and uploaded to Weigel. Uh, the idea here is to capture the SSIDs that are at your target location. Uh, the use for that, you know, th there might be more than one use, but the use that we could see easily is that you can pre-compute your hash tables um, for WPA and WPA2. You know, we're going to kind of go into why that might not be necessary much anymore. Uh, 
obviously if you're going to pre-compute a, a dictionary file with an SSID, it's going to take a certain amount of time. To do that across a thousand SSIDs is going to take much longer. So if you can get that down and, and you know what the SSID is going into it beforehand, that will be helpful in, in pre-computing a hash table as opposed to hashing directly at the time. So, so what we did here in this screenshot is basically go to waggle.net and search an address. That address is going to be displayed in this manner in larger cities, unlike South Dakota Spearfish, there's 10, 20, 30 SSIDs listed across Spearfish. I, I don't know, maybe 40. Anyway, this is downtown Denver, where people war drive consistently with their GPS pucks enabled, they're gathering data, and they're uploading these captures with SSID tags. So the SSID info you see here may be reflective of where you are located. So in broadcasting this information, you're giving a pretty good amount of information away by just broadcasting your SSIDs. People drive by, capture it, upload it, guess what? Now we can, uh, thanks to, I guess, Josh Wright, CalPatty, some of those tools we're going to discuss in a little bit, pre-compute hash tables. And again, Kent's going to demo that. But what we've got is a pretty good start for breaking into your wireless networks. Absolutely. Moving forward, while uh, Wi-Fi travel kits, I'll kind of let Jordan talk about that one. This is just uh, some stock photos Kent put together here in our new studio. We're working on getting better at our live casting, video casting, and demos. But anyway, this is one of the things we carry. So Alpha and their adapters have been giving us a hard time, actually. Some of, we've had a couple burnout in the last three months as we're testing and playing and toying around. But anyway, you got to have a pile of adapters. And I'm going to skip Raspberry Pis and discuss them at the end, but that battery pack you see there in the front, solar battery pack is going to power my Pis. We carry Wi-Fi pineapples. You've got to have Kali and Kismet. Well, you don't have to have Kismet, but Kali is a standard. The GPS puck you see right there, the BU-353, this thing is standard if you're trying to war drive or you're trying to map the boundaries of your customer on-site networks. You want to geotag. Um, it really, really helps. And then the G-Men Chrome case. But anyway, the Raspberry Pi, as you see there, one of them we use for a man in the middle. The other one was our Evil Pi. So basically, the Evil Pi runs host APD WPE. That allows us to capture your net NTLM authentication hashes once we have cloned your radius SSID. Um, we also ran that with just uh, Airmon, Aircrack. And, and basically, that little Pi with the Rock you list Hopefully our live demo goes well, but we can demonstrate, I mean, even a device that small can shred the rock you list against a four-way handshake in a capture file and give you the key to a network if it's in there. I mean, it is frightening how simple it is to actually get all this stuff in this case together and destroy a network. There's probably 300 bucks in gear, maybe 200 bucks in gear in here, and it, it's just, wireless is dangerous. It absolutely is. Do it right. Moving on forward, we're going to talk about the uh, on-site tools that we're going to use. Uh, Airmon, uh, NG, Air Replay, and Aerodump. And, uh, you know, what we really want to say here is if you see something, say something. You've got to teach your employees to do that as well. You're going to see that at B-Sides uh, where Jordan was trying to get the cops called on him, doing whatever he could to try to get someone to say, hey, there's this suspicious activity. Uh, someone needs to look at it. Surprisingly, uh, no cops did get called, and he had a great fun time in a parking lot getting some uh, Wi-Fi up and going. Was he wearing a hoodie? I no, I had on a cowboy hat and a fake mustache. <laughs> no, no, you got to wear a hoodie. Uh, the hoodie is what's required for people to think that you're a hacker. With the with the cowboy hat, the fake mustache, and the wireless antennas, you're just confusing people because they contradict each other, and it just neutralizes everything out like water. <laughs> He was uh, definitely not up to no good. Moving on forward, the, the cracking tools that we're going to use, uh, we're going to demonstrate some of these today. Um, you know, the big one for Wi-Fi is uh, Aircrack NG. Um, we are going to demonstrate that one. And then also with Hashcat, uh, that's kind of the one that I've preferred. Uh, of course, one of the troubles using Hashcat is always getting to their, their special format that they want hashes in and caps in. Uh, that can sometimes be a headache. Other tools out there, uh, John the Ripper, Cal Patty, uh, Gen PMK, Power to Sleep, and Air Decap. Air Decap will actually take uh, a cap file from a, a wireless NIC in, in promiscuous mode, in listening mode, and uh, if you know the, the SSID and the WPA key, 
you'll be able to decrypt all of that uh, PCAP and actually see the data that's uh, traversing that network. So it's definitely interesting. We're going to jump right in here and uh, show some Let's Capture. Essentially, this is the Airmon, NG, and AirDump uh, applications. Uh, the first uh, screen in the upper right-hand corner there is what it looks like when we're trying to scan in our office. Uh, it's a very busy office we have here. There's a lot of Wi-Fi. For a small town that we're in, it, we've got a lot of traffic around here in the campus. Uh, the next two screenshots there are us actually taking the WPA handshakes and capturing them using AeroDump. And those WPA handshakes are what's necessary to later uh, crack that WPA key. So this is a pretty straightforward process. And uh, Jordan, do you have a thumbs up? I think we're good to go. All right, I'm going to go ahead and go one more slide here. We're going to try. The uh, next step after capturing those handshakes is going to be cr trying to crack it. So this is a, kind of a demonstration of this. It's a very simple command. We're going to take that capture file that we get out of AeroDump, and we're going to put it against a uh, word list, a dictionary. And then it's going to go try all those iterations and find us an answer. And that answer, of course, is the WPA uh, pre-shared key. Uh, if you'll notice, what I've used here for a, a password is 10 five digits. And uh, I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in the upcoming slides about why I chose that. But uh, I'm going to, I think I'm going to pass the controls here over to Jordan. And Sierra, any questions while we transition now over to me as presenter? Uh, nope, I think we're good. If you guys have questions, you can um, ask them. If I can't answer them, then we'll just wait until they have another break, and we'll, we'll feel them. So you guys can go ahead. All right, Jordan, I'm making you presenter right now. Let's see if we can make this work. And I'm answering questions, too, for you guys, like, live while it goes as well. So now I was going to do is, like, show your screen, and we'll see if this whole thing is working. It might be because I'm answering them and John is answering them. Yeah. yeah. Sweetness. There we go. All right. We are capturing against a target SSID. The commands I skipped here. Kent, can you go back one? Well, they won't be able to see it on the screen. Oh, thank you. Yeah, my fault. So, basically, let me control C here. We'll go through a quick demo. Basically, we do uh, an airmon ng check kill. This command goes out, runs a couple things, and makes sure like uh, DHCP client, WPA supplicant, a couple other things are not running. Then we run our airmon ng start WLAN zero. It fires off a actually. IW config, a WLAN zero mon interface, and I'm not going to show you the initial command where I run arrow dump ng against WLAN zero mon. And I'm not going to show you that because you would see all the SSIDs in our building, and I don't know how our neighbors feel about that. So I also have the luxury of already having captured the BSSID target MAC address. I've got my file configured here. I'm going to go ahead and run that. And we're just going to wait a second here and see if we can get a client to connect. What's your SSID here, Jordan? The SSID here is the WPA2. Got it. I'm going to go ahead and connect to that now. Thank you, sir. So we're just capturing data, waiting, and eventually we're going to see there our handshake. Go. Boom. Just like that. Now I can stop this. And let's see what we got here. Just so you guys know what I did right there. All I did is went to my iPhone, selected the SSID on my wireless list, prompted me for the uh, pre-shared key. I typed in 555, 555, 5555, and it joined me to that network. Now, our next tool, AirCrack. I am running this against a pre-computed cheater dictionary file. So we know my password is in here. However, let's go ahead and run that same. Yeah, you'll notice there it says two of two keys tested. Um, that's because our dictionary file has two keys in it. One, of course, is 555, 555, 555, But let's go ahead and run this against the standard RockU. Now, this is on a VM with one CPU and two gigs of RAM. Any guesses, Ken, on how long this is going to take? <laughs> could take good. all day. It could take, oh, five seconds. And there it goes. So notice in there it says... Uh, Number 856 out of uh, Rocky includes 555, 555, 555, 555. One thing you'll notice about Rocky, also CrackStation, 
they are massive lists and they include a lot of things that are abstract and some things that aren't. Obviously this isn't really a difficult pre-shared key, but I did choose it for a reason. We're going to show that coming up here as well. Any questions on our demo uh, that we've got here? Uh, we have a couple, yeah. Okay. Um, you need a Faraday cage. Oh, wait, oh, that's not one. <laughs> we, we talk about using a Faraday cage. Yeah, we talk about building a little tin foil cardboard box. Uh, I, um, I need to know that. Is it, is, it now connect, is it still possible to DAF users currently connected? Absolutely, of Absolutely. course, and that, that would have been part of the demo, but again, I would have had to monitor a little wider airspace, and for the sake of a live demo, I mean, that went pretty well. It could have gone horribly, and John would have fired me. <laughs> yeah, that would have been bad, because we have a lot of like like heavy industrial equipment around our office, and we, are, we don't want the pneumatic press to go off and start killing people maximum Absolutely. overdrive style. Um, <laughs> Absolutely but, not. But that wasn't a good password, so what if you had it, a good password? It was password? not. Absolutely. If you have a, a better we, password? Yeah, we have a couple reasons we used this one. And yes. we would like to discuss that, so we're definitely going to. And yeah, bear with us well, just a moment. And we ultimately, we, we can't we can't have a webcast where we sit around for sixteen hours waiting for it to crack. Oh, <laughs> Absolutely man. not. Now your attackers have plenty of time and the luxury of that. Absolutely, and I will will say that on the uh, item of DOP, you know, all I did was connect my phone to it. We had a device listening on the specific channel, listening on uh, for any traffic with that SSID. We had it pretty specific. Um, it's not to say that you couldn't uh, monitor an SSID and start de-authing clients. And uh, Jordan, which tool is that that'll do that? Uh, Arrow, Arrow Dump will allow you to okay. target an airspace, right? If we're going to look at BG on Airmon, we get channels 1 through 11, basically. And you run Airmon on your monitor interface. Once that is running, Kali gives you this beautiful list of all the SSIDs and all the channels they're listening on. Again, for the sake of demo, I had the opportunity to pick out my MAC address, pick out my channel, but in a, in a wider scope, you would use Airmon initially to pick out your target SSID, the channel, the MAC, and then you would run it specifically against your target so that when clients or a client you de-authed, or a client connected, you capture that handshake. Absolutely. So uh, what about Hashcat? And the next slide here, we're going to show how this works in Hashcat. The first thing to do is to use Aircrack, and you actually take Aircrack, uh, specify your PCAP file, and then you go specify of the handshakes which uh, SSID you want. And the reason you need that SSID with that PCAP is because the SSID is using the computation of the hash to be able to uh, generate the hash that has the keys in it. So we've got the uh, command there, aircrack and gcap with the j, uh, and then the output file. So we take that output file, and we put it into hashcat. So this is kind of where I want to talk about why we're using uh, a 10-digit number. And uh, someone reached out to us, one of our active audience listeners, uh, Dallas Hasselhorst, reached out to us and said, hey, you know, I've got this blog post out there from something that happened to me in, in my area, and uh, you guys are welcome to use it. And I was like, all right, well, well, we'll take a look. Essentially, what he ran into is an ISP that was uh, selling a connectivity service, but they included a, a modem that had a Wi-Fi access point on it, and they were releasing those modems to the to their users with the phone number as the as the pre-shared key. Needless to say, he kind of went back and forth with the ISP on that to try to circumvent that and say why it's not a great idea. And I think I can say in this screen, this screen here is why it's not a good idea. What I've done is taken Hashcat, and uh, these are the commands necessary to run Hashcat for WPA and WPA2. Uh, if you'll notice the input mode on the top screen, I've got a mask in there, and I'm specifying 555. Now, obviously, 555, not a legitimate uh, area code, but if you are trying to crack a... Uh, a pre-shared key, you probably know the area code that you're, you're looking within. So you can kind of take it. If they're using a phone number for pre-shared key, you're going to know those first three. You'll notice that the mask is 10 digits long, so it's 555 five, five, followed by seven digits. Uh, if you skip down a little bit, you'll notice the hash target there. We've got our target. That came from error crack. Time started. We've got the time started in there. And you'll notice that the uh, second line on there says session name. I've got that grayed out, but the status is cracked. So we were able to crack this entire session, uh, entire key in five seconds. Now this was not using a word dictionary. This was Hashcat trying all of those iterations using the compute to create the hash and find the matching hash. Um, you'll notice there that we recovered one of one with one salt, which is the SSID. 
and we did that in five seconds. So that's pretty impressive, you know, and it kind of brings out, yeah, we did it with Rock U because it was in the dictionary, but you don't necessarily need the dictionary. Obviously, more difficult if it's al alphanumerics, very long keys would be more difficult here, but really, I kind of wanted to, to validate for Dal uh, Dallas Hasselhorst that, yeah, using a phone number for pre-shared key, not a great idea. Uh, the next example here I give is Hashcat, and this time I don't specify the area code. I give 10 digits uh, complete, so Hashcat is going to try all 10 digits and try to find that pre-shared key. Uh, and I didn't get the screenshot for this one, but you'll see time started there. I took the screenshot at 22 seconds. The time estimated, uh, it will have tried all of those possible combinations with 10 digits within 4 hours and 22 minutes. So if you are using a pre-shared key that has your phone number, it will absolutely can be cracked within 4 hours 22 minutes. So that's kind of what we wanted to bring up and why we chose that 555 number. I'm going to go ahead and go to the next slide here. We're going to crack something with Hashcat one more time. The first slide was WPA. This is WPA2. Uh, the algorithms are still the same. So there's not a big amount of difference here. Uh, again, I kind of went through the same thing. Show the time is this time 6 seconds. Really not any difference there. Uh, and then the second section here, uh, second slide, uh, excuse me, screenshot, you'll see that the mask again is 10 digits long. This time I actually let it complete that crack. It was going to be four hours before. It cracked 555, 555, 5555 in 46 minutes and 38 seconds. So not long at all. Uh, the key thing there is, again, phone numbers for pre-shared keys are not a great idea. Nor is uh, pre-shared key with your business name or your last name. <laughs> So, uh, question. Some people want to know what is the hardware that we have with the Kraken that, for this example that you guys are running. I know the Kraken setup that we have here is not crazy. Um, we need to upgrade it, but what is our hardware specs on that box? Absolutely. Uh, it's got an SSD card which has the uh, dictionary list on it, which is important to be able to read in and out on that. Uh, but for the actual GPU power, it has four AMD uh, 980s in it. So. It's pretty powerful, but it's not the most powerful. I think the, the big ones out there today um, that are, I'm not going to say affordable, but common use for this type of thing are going to be the NVIDIA 1080s. Um, I think those prices are somewhere between 600 and 1,000 apiece. Again, we're using four uh, 980s. Uh, those cost today probably between three and 600. So we're not talking about a huge investment to be able to do the exact same thing with this kind of compute power. That is accurate. Can, can you go back to the uh, Weigel slide? Yes, there's something absolutely. I wanted to point out in there. Since we're discussing ISPs and poor deployment of wireless, uh, if you look on here for a very common theme, the SSID that stood out to me here was Xfinity. And I've been reading Kevin uh, Mitnick's book about identity. And he talked about Comcast and their use of modems and with those modems that you rent from them, they're including this Xfinity Wi-Fi. So basically what they're doing is offering you a free neighborly SSID. That, I mean, clearly, I think there's probably 50 instances of it here in Denver, and they are the primary ISP out there. But just ISPs and mismanagement of our information and our, uh, I don't know. I just wanted to bring that up. Absolutely. All right, we're going to move forward one more here. So this is WPA2 Hashcat. And the next slide is really what happens once you get connected. Now you've got that pre-shared key. What can you do with it? And uh, these are a couple applications that are commonly used. And uh, Responder and BetterCap. Jordan, you want to talk about those? Oh, absolutely. So I don't know if we're going to do we, do we want to demo this? No, we're not going to demo this one. This might get ugly. So what, what we said here basically is, okay, now I've broken into your network. Um, we've got your keys. We can get in. First thing we did was run uh, Responder. If you're not familiar with the Responder pack, that thing is amazing. Um, it's got a lot of magic. I was trying to mess with uh, inline HTTP proxies, inject.js, inject.html. So there's some really nasty stuff you can do. But basically the goal here is we're going to run Responder. We're just going to listen in default configuration mode. And if someone asks for a service on the network that hits NBNS, LLMNR, or something I can poison in response, 
I am going to respond as if I am that target. And so on the right, you see us grabbing Brad Arnold's hash. Uh, yes, so, uh, hold on, hold on. A couple of quick things. Uh, some people are pointing out that you do need to man in the middle first once you're on the wireless network, and that depends on the wireless network. For some wireless networks, yes, you would absolutely need to be able to do man in the middle if they actually have client isolation enabled, but on some networks where they don't have client isolation, you can actually see all these requests, and then things like Responder can jump in as well, so you'll be able to pull that down. And we, we had a webcast earlier about Responder, but I think, guys, we're probably at the point where we need to have just a webcast dedicated to nothing but, like, Responder and better cap, better cap demos. Absolutely. You know, better cap is, uh, we did play with that one a little bit, uh, trying to get a, a solid demo working, and what I learned about it quickly is that it's scary. Essentially, you put it up, and it forces all of your clients into a proxy that it holds, and, yeah, it's kind of a scary deal. Let me go ahead and go to the next slide here, and we've now discussed that pre-shared keys are bad. Um, you know, yeah, you can make them really long, but they're still crackable eventually. If you make them super long, awesome. Maybe they're not crackable, but are they still a threat vector? You know, kind of what I came into here is saying that radius will be better, right? Or maybe not. And of course, we've got our Pac-Man there to, to come and chow everything down. So a better way of doing it then. 8021x, and that is, of course, with radius and a WPA key that transitions and changes. You can no longer look for that PSK and expect it to stay uh, the same for more than how long it is. It's a very short time period. Uh, depending on manufacturer and how they implement. Absolutely. So, but the keys are rotating basically continuously. Absolutely. So, Darrell, let's let you talk about this slide here. Uh, we we couldn't have a webcast without these two individuals trying to deal with a hacker on their network. And that GIF looks awesome. <laughs> Does it, did it come through all right? Yes, it worked perfect. Yeah, it's coming through. It's coming through fine. <laughs> John was also worried about us using this. But anyway, what, what we do here basically is we stand up our evil AP using host APD WP. If we can beat the RSSI algorithm that your clients go through continuously with our evil APs radio or produce a stronger signal and convince your clients to jump over to our 8021X supporting evil AP, we can convince your client as well to submit a hash. And so if you look at that certificate prompt we got, it, it was sort of surprising to see that it doesn't say this belongs to Cali evil host dot AP dot whatever and instead produced just a strange thumbprint that didn't really mean much to me so I went ahead and clicked OK of course the host APD WPE project isn't really actively maintained anymore I haven't seen any updates or branches or forks in that git repo for some time and we also saw recently in troubleshooting this against a fully patched Windows 10 client that this solution uh, or, or I guess this attack may have been solved by Microsoft. So basically if you are running Windows 10 clients that are fully patched, I think it was a November patch, Kent, that makes sense? So there was a November patch that came out that forced TLS 1.2 for the EAP process and this, this basically broke our attack vector. Yeah, the reason it, it seemed to break in it is uh, FreeRadius doesn't handle TLS 1.2 as well as it should. It's uh, non-compatible with Windows, essentially. So if you're running FreeRadius with uh, TLS 1.2, you probably have a lot of trouble getting connected on a patched Windows system. Exactly. And it, if any of you want to step up and probably implement some solutions in host APD, WP, uh, or FreeRadius, or... Yeah, Ben just pointed out that it was updated in November of 2016, and I will send the link to everybody, and we'll send it to all. It looks like it's on tools.cali.org, and you can pull it down there. So thank you very much. So ben just got that out. So Ben, you're a rock star. Thank you, sir. Thank you. And I wonder, does that fix include, do we want to review that real quick? Does that fix include the updated TLS? <laughs> I'm um, not sure. I haven't looked at it, but okay. uh, I'll look at it here in a second while we're going. So just give me a second. You guys keep going, and I'll find out. That okay. would be awesome. Um, we can do a live demo on this one, too. Okay. So we're going to move forward here on, on how this works. 
uh, attacking the 802.1x clients, of course, the idea here is we're just going to launch up host, uh, host APD WP with the configuration and essentially have a radius client connect to it and see what happens. Uh, you'll see we did this. We've got a screenshot of it here where we captured, we captured ben.arnold and we captured uh, the hash on it. And uh, Jordan, I'll let you switch you over here so you can present the demo of this. There you go. Let's do this. Whoop. Let's go there. All right, how's that look? We got our Cali window back. There one, NG, check kill. And then we are. We can sell that. Let's go. Let's go actually look at that comp file real quick. Basically, if you do an apt get install on host apd wpe, it comes out of the box in a way that allows us to. Oof, I'm going to get in big trouble for using nano here. But it comes in like pre-configured, ready to go. All you need to do is change the SSID name. So the only thing modified in this file is our SSID to match our client or match our target. And then we're going to launch our host APD, WP. AP enabled. We'll give that a minute to see if there's any radius clients around here. Hopefully there is, right? That is the hope. Hopefully I can get my phone to connect. <laughs> so this affects Windows 7, Windows 8, 8, 1, iPhone. Is your iPhone patched? My iPhone is fully patched. So right now I'm connecting uh, to this radius, uh, the nice guys, um, with my iPhone. And as soon as I tried to connect to it, instead of asking me for a pre-shared key, it's asking me for a username and password. So I'm going to type those in right now. And as most live demos go, this will probably go down in flames. And uh, after I typed in my username and password, said connect, now says, oh, there's a server certificate error here. Uh, you probably shouldn't trust this guy. But I really want on this Wi-Fi. I'm just going to go ahead and say, yeah, I, I want to trust this. I, I know what I'm doing here. Now, you notice, uh, as soon as I have now connected, uh, we have captured that hash uh, where I typed in ben.arnold. And uh, that is in an essence, capturing the 802.1x radius activity there. Um, you know, the idea here is that you could go to a site uh, that has 802.1x uh, radius, go in there, match the SSID, get a more powerful access point, and uh, have host APD WP on it. And it's, essentially what's going to happen is as soon as that client uh, realizes there's a more powerful access point, it's going to switch over and it's going to have to re-authenticate on uh, our evil AP here. And when it does that, it has to submit those credentials. Now, obviously, with Windows, it's not going to submit the, the straight credentials. It's going to submit the hash. And uh, as you can see here, it was captured. Uh, on the screenshot, you'll see uh, the username, the challenge, and the response. When you go to crack this, you need uh, both the challenge and response, and also the username. So those th three things together uh, create a scenario that you can crack those. Uh, what you see here is the JTR, is the John the Ritter uh, syntax that you could run and uh, capture it that way. I'm going to pass the presentation back, Jordan, and I'll show our next slide. I would be happy to do that, sir. So from that demo, we demonstrated that. You can see now, see, we've got that Ben Arnold hash. Uh, it's, of course, going to be different on the demo than it is here, just from uh, every time you're going to get a different hash like that. So I'm going to go to the next slide. I'm going to see cracking and net NTLM hashes. So we're now going to take that hash that we pulled off of uh, host APD WPE, and we're going to try to crack it. And what we've done here is I've showed the radius hash log. Um, that's that hash that we pulled out of uh, WPE. We're going to crack it on Hashcat. You see the uh, syntax there. The M5500 uh, is specifying the type of hash. The A3 is specifying uh, the type of attack mode. And we're saying that we're going to brute force. The W3 is specifying the workload. I think workload 3 is uh, tuned, I believe. It's a little bit better than normal. And uh, as you can see there, the dash O output.pot is me exporting uh, whatever hashes we find. Now, the mask there I kind of wanted to talk about, uh, which is 
Let's see if I can highlight that here. The mask is this. Well, let's try it one more time. The hash is, sorry, the mask is right here. This uh, question mark U, question mark L. What that is doing is I'm specifying uh, a uh, algorithm that I want to be used very specifically. And it's capital letter followed by five small letters followed by, or excuse me, seven small letters followed by four digits followed by a symbol. And this obviously limits the number of brute force attempts we need to make. But I kind of wanted to demonstrate this here because winter 2001 with a bang, uh, spring 2013 percent sign, summer 1987 dollar sign, autumn 2525 at sign are all going to match in there. Now obviously any other uh, combination that matches that syntax also will get matched in here. The main thing I wanted to point out with our hashing rig, uh, all 101 trillion, 942 million, billion. Uh, some billion, thank you, possibilities. <laughs> We'll take at most 36 minutes. So if your radius uh, user has a password that matches something like that, if we captured it using uh, WPE, we're going to capture it in, or hash that in 36 minutes. We're going to get that password. Um, again, this is brute force. We captured it. I uh, got hashed it out winter 2016. Bang. Time was 2 minutes 6 seconds. Uh, the last screenshot here on the bottom uh, shows the output of that pot file. And at the very end, you'll see uh, winter 2016. Do you so, want to talk about that last run you did through uh, an Active Directory database? I think the percentage was something like two thirds matched, capital first letter, uh, several letters yes. plus a special at the end. Recently helped with uh, an engagement and uh, was given the dict file from Active Directory, which essentially has all of the hashes and uh, said, hey, go crack this. So I did my work on it, you know, put it through different uh, variations. Some of them I used masks, some of them I used Rocky, Matthew, Rocky with masks, and we used crack station. We ended up getting, I think, around 60% of the, the hits back. Of the passwords we were able to hash out, I think two-thirds of them followed a very similar mask as this, where if, in all case scenario, you know, I could have just typed in this mask and actually caught, you know, a significant number from the client. Uh, obviously, we really should talk about better passwords and better PSK keys. So any questions on uh, cracking NTLM hashes or uh, host APD? Um, nice job. That masking is very interesting. Um, yeah, we got a bunch of questions, but they're kind of like backtracked. So, um, sure, that's fine. Let's do this. Asking them. I'm answering them at the same time. But... Um, how much more time is required, this is from a while ago, for cracking between WPA2 and, say, enterprise using CAP or PEAT? Did we answer that already? Uh, we did not answer that. And I can, what we'll do is uh, I'll run a benchmark that will show uh, from our cracking rig uh, the different hash speeds, and that'll kind of be used for comparison. Um, we'll get that thrown together today, and Siri, I'll get it off to you, and you can post it as necessary. Neat. Um, for WP. S enabled devices, would you still try and crack the hash or crack the WPS pin with Weaver? WPS pin. It's the four, the first four are predictable and the last four are brute forceable. Yes. In and moments. Yeah, the WPS pin, there are tools out there that will make that incredibly easy to crack. Um, essentially, it just brute forces all the digits and, and finds it. Uh, the interesting thing about WPS, I believe, is you can find them, it's broken into half, so eight digits, but you can you can simultaneously check uh, two sets of four. So it goes relatively quickly, which is um, very interesting. Somebody said pixie dust. Um, for the Kraken OS, do you use a Linux VM within a Windows OS install or just straight Nix install? Yeah, you want to be careful with your uh, operating system whenever you're dealing with Hashcat. Uh, guys, we've, we've had some situations where simply installing some updates uh, tend to cr break it. Yeah. <laughs> So that's why the Kraken tends to be offline and not directly accessible. You got to go through a bunch of hoops to actually get there because it's it's kind of insecure. And I think even in the past they've come right out and say use this version, um, and they don't care much about patches at all. The last one was a kernel update that bricked. And uh, downtime of that system is uh, headaches for everybody because it's a, yes. a well used system that everybody wants access on. So. Pixie Dust was referencing the WPS attack. Oh, was it? Okay. I haven't seen that one. Um, they wanted to know if 
someone wanted to know if we were going to talk about that, but I don't think that's in your slides, so we might add that to our list of good ideas for future webcasts. We, I can, we I can talk about the web. We skipped WPF and web just because it's... Yeah, I don't think they're enterprise solutions, but John, go ahead and take the hand there. Yeah, I think that this was released back in 20... like early 2015? Um, I, I can't remember, but it was basically an offline attack um, that allowed you to brute force the pin associated with WPS. So it's been around for a while. I, I haven't seen it used all that much, but it is something. Somebody could correct me if I'm wrong, but I thought it was 2015. I'm not sure. But, uh, but no, it's been around for a long, long, long time. It's just a little program that you can. <laughs> then, then he has to put in something like, um, I use it on my neighbor's network still. Uh, that's, so why would he need it? What? <laughs> I, okay, so apparently it's being used by that guy against his his name uh, his neighbors, um, and also uh, Pete brought up a very good point. Um, there's a number of devices that actually stop this type of attack, so you have to be attacking a device um, either early 2015 or late or before 2015 for this attack to work because a number of these things, um, a number of the newer devices have it patched. But that being said, still to this day, we still see some devices that come up. I was talking to Larry about this. Was it Larry? I can't remember what I was talking about with it. A while ago, you still see some new devices periodically that still come out with this particular vulnerability. Um, so you'll hear people say, it has been patched, but um, that, that's, that's kind of a dumb term because there's so many different things out there that may not have it patched. Um, Sean, who's terrifying me now, who's attacking his neighbors, <laughs> says Comc uh, Comcast routers in every house have this vulnerability, and I'll just have to take his word for it. So I'll kick it back over to you guys as well. Awesome. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Jason just brought me. So are you saying there's a secure version of WPS? No. I didn't say that there was a secure version of WPS. No, I'm just saying that there's some that the tool doesn't work on. Oh, my God. I don't want that to actually go through as well. <laughs> All right, we're going to go to the next slide here. So what are the lessons learned here? And there's a couple things that we should talk about. Length rather than complexity on passwords. You know, obviously, we're able to generate these masks that can crack things pretty quickly. So complexity is necessary, but what really burns out uh, hashing quickly is the length. The longer you can make those pre-shared keys, the longer you can make those passwords, the better off you're going to be. Uh, max on WPA, uh, WPA2 is going to be 63 characters. And, and why not the max? You know, something that can come up is you can actually use a group call screen. Because depending on the scope of your engagement. Absolutely. What the? Why? Yeah, if you call it that, why not the max? I might have to disagree with my own people that are presenting, um, because none of the security people on this webcast want to die uh, tied to a, a, a stake in the middle of their courtyard at their place of business. Um, I would say sane is like 25 characters uh, would be pretty easy with a good passphrase, and you're not going to crack that anytime really soon. We Absolutely. may not crack that, John, but... Depending on the scope of our engagement, if we have physical access to your laptops, we can con boot them and we can pull your wireless config files. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. But at that point, you're dead in the water anyway, right? Um, so it doesn't matter if I can pop that box, then I can pull it off. And I think we're going to talk about that here in a bit as well. Yeah, absolutely. If you know if someone that has a laptop in the business and they do have the uh, wireless key, because Windows stores those keys and presents them as, as straight text. So if someone does have a laptop and you do gain access to that laptop at Starbucks when they're using the restroom, pop in Comboot or Bash Bunny and you can pull those uh, that SSID key off pretty quickly. So physical access obviously there is a, a very questionable thing and again they don't have to be connected to that access point at that time to be able to pull that off. You're just trying to use Windows, look in the registry keys and pull the password out there. Exactly. And people share, right? I want it on my phone, I want it on my laptop and my kids here hanging out, can we put it on the iPad? And Pre-shared keys. Absolutely. And something that we didn't bring up today is uh, using Mac to uh, to authenticate with or to filter out your clients. And the reason we didn't is because it's so easy to to get around. You know, you could listen on that SSID for devices and then just snag one of their Macs. So uh, doing it better, we would say if your enterprise or lower, you really need to be doing it better with 802.1x radius. Get it set up properly. Make sure you have server certificate validation. And what that's going to do is that if you do have a Windows client with the GPO set up properly, and someone walks in with their uh, their evil AP with host APD WP on it, they're not even going to be able to get the opportunity to connect to it. You know, Windows is going to look at that AP and say it's higher signal power, but it doesn't have the service certificate that I require to be on that SSID to connect to. And of course, better user passwords.
It is also difficult to say patch first, ask questions later, but patch first, Absolutely. ask questions later. For the small business market, um, well, what we're going to suggest is 802.1x radius, better user passwords, and server certificate validation. The key thing there is we just said the exact same thing for enterprise, and yeah, we did. Um, the days that you can just use a pre-shared key in your business, it's pretty much gone. Uh, it just You can get around it so quickly, even with long keys, especially if you've got uh, people with laptops that travel. Again, all we need is access to that uh, device for a couple moments to pull that key off. Uh, I've got some reading links here. Uh, I did mention David Hasselhorst. Uh, that is the one that's uh, Linux included. That's his blog post on why phone numbers make horrible Wi-Fi passwords. I've also got uh, a couple links there regarding WPA tables, uh, mm -hmm. pre-computing the hashes on them. Josh Wright has pre-computed about a thousand. There's a thousand SSID dictionary file download. There is also a million, or he's working on the million. I can't remember. There was a million SSID or something like that. And that's that's pretty big, you know. Uh, those dictionary files and hash tables are pre-computed already, so, so you may you, not need to. If you have an SSID that matches what's in there, you won't need to really hash it all. You'll just use the tables. Uh, I've also got the link to fixing EAP TLS 1.0 support. This is a, a workaround. So we said that Microsoft had that fix that forced uh, those clients using the TLS 1.2. Um, there's a red key that can force it back to uh, support the old TLS. And this, this was the only way we could prove one way or the other whether our configuration sucked or if Microsoft had actually fixed the problem, which it appears they did. Fortunately, what we did do, though, is we had a uh, old Windows 8 install that we uh, utilized, threw up a, a brand new Windows 8 with no updates on it, and was able to uh, get in there. That, that and and there's kind of also funny, one. Yeah. Oh, I was going to say, it's kind of funny that Microsoft releases this patch that fixes a lot of security issues with this, and then they immediately have to release articles so people can do a retroactive <laughs> of the overall security. <laughs> <laughs> You know, anyone that was using free radius, that was uh, you trying to use free radius, and Microsoft directly went to 1.2. Um, all it of a sudden, broke. free radius was going to be broke for all those users. So they had to provide a way for, for backwards compatibility, even though the problem wasn't necessarily Microsoft. The problem was actually in free radius. Yes. So there was one thing we did not demo here, and maybe we should have taken a picture of it. But John also pointed out that Windows 10 clients, when you are logged off and sitting there, you can walk up to them then click on the little wireless button bottom right and configure wireless. Mm -hmm. So if you can join it to your evil AP, guess what? Yeah, I, I couldn't believe that the first time I saw it. I think it was the first time I was doing the Man in the Middle uh, webcast about a year ago and uh, screwing around with a notebook computer. And yeah, you can join wireless networks without logging in. And I don't. And I, I know why Microsoft is doing that, but I don't know why they thought that was a good idea. The reason why they did that is they wanted you to be able to authenticate uh, back up to like uh, like Microsoft's cloud service to make sure that your user ID and password works properly. If it's changed on the cloud, it's changed locally. And uh, sure as hell, yeah, you sit down in a Windows box, bring up an evil access point when someone's not there, join the evil access point, and just have a good time. I've even seen. Um, I've even seen situations where kiosk systems, uh, you can shut down the kiosk system, turn it back on, then join the network and actually capture um, some password hashes that way. So, so kind of crazy. Now we got 57 is not equal 75. I don't know where that comes from. Isn't there but, another uh, neat trick in Windows where by default they're wanting to gather your SSIDs and pre-share keys and put them in the cloud somewhere and share them with your friends. That was that was one of those features where it's like share your wireless profile with your friends. Um, and it, that's every bit as bad as it sounds as well. And I think it's on by default. Privacy be darned. Someone just asked, they said, can you PowerShell the wireless config? Nope, you can use NetSH WLAN and you can export it. So if you just do a, uh, a, a Google search for NetSH WLAN export, you can export the wireless configs and you can even export them with the password clear text or you can export them with the quote unquote encrypted SS, uh, the password and then import it on your box and then view it that way. So yeah, there's, it's not, you can do it with PowerShell, but the command is netshwlan, and I think it's like export, and then you give it the profile. Awesome. John, Sierra, any questions out there? 
Um, the, who I think John got most of them. If you got a dumb answer that came from John, that was me. So I'm using his other. <laughs> I like how she jumps on that that hand grenade. Of course, that was Sierra. That was <laughs> me. <laughs> so, so yeah, I didn't like a attribute all my answers or my comments to me, but um, yeah. So hopefully we got. I think John covered all the questions we got. And we don't let us win. Patch. Use 8021X. Validate your service certificates. Yes. All right, everybody. Well, thank you so much. Yep. Yes, I am John's doppelganger. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, this was recorded, so you can relive it forever and ever. Thank you so much, everybody. Talk to you all later. Bye. Thank you.